We are ready to start our third press conference uh, and second of today. And this press conference is on how ancient organisms move in and fed, finding out more from fossils. And taking part in this media briefing, we have a panel of three UK researchers. Peter Falkingham is a lecturer at the Natural Sciences and Psychology at the Liverpool John Moores University. Imran uh, Rahman is a research fellow at the Oxford University Museum and Natural History. And Thomas Clements is a PhD student at the Department of Geology at the University of Leicester. And I'll hand over to our speakers who will give some short presentations and we'll then follow, uh, we'll open the floor for questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm Peter Falkingham and I wanna talk about some of the work that I've been doing with Stephen Gatesy at Brown University in the US. And we've been using uh, extant animals, live guinea fowl, to understand footprint formation, to translate that to dinosaur tracks and understanding how dinosaur tracks formed. So here's a dinosaur track on the slides. Uh, this is a fairly uh, stereotypical dinosaur track. It might be what you think of when you see a track. It's, it's like a mold of a foot. It looks like a foot preserved in stone. And tracks are really good because tracks preserve motion. They pr they're made while during the animal's life, not like a skeleton which is left behind once it's dead. So in that regard, there's a lot of information in there. And the uh, factors that go into producing a track, you have the foot shape, the anatomy, and you have the substrate, so sandy or clay. And you also have the dynamics, so the way the foot is moving. And you can imagine if you're walking along a beach, and if you're running along a beach, you'll leave different footprints depending on how fast you're going, even if the sediment is the same and, and your foot shape is obviously staying the same. And so my thing is, how much of the dynamics can we get out? How much can we understand how these extinct dinosaurs moved based on their footprints? Here's a really interesting footprint. This is not like the mold of the foot that we just saw. This is weird. So this is a 200 million year old dinosaur track. It's quite small, about five, six centimeters long. And you can see it has this weird bendy middle toe, the side toes sort of curve round, and there's this big lump in the middle. Maybe it's a pathology, maybe there's something wrong with the toe that's caused that. How do we interpret something like this? Well, we use experimental uh, biology and we use modern birds to look at how footprints are formed. And we've done this using high-speed video and high-speed x-ray video. So here's a bird running across some mud. <laughs> and you'll agree, there's only so much information we can get out. We have a shape of a footprint and we know how fast it was going. But the problem is the foot is hidden from view when it makes the footprint because the foot has sunk into the sediment. So we used a giant machine. This is the Keck facility at Brown University. And up in the top, we can see we have two X-ray emitters. We have a tray of sediment here. We're actually using poppy seeds because it behaves like sand, but it's less dense so we can see through it with the X-rays. And we have a trackway that the guinea fowl can get up to speed on. So what happens is, here's the setup in 3D. We have two light cameras at 250 frames a second. We have two X-ray cameras at 250 frames a second. We take a CT scan of the bird and then we match the bones to the X-ray images. And this is the result. We can see for the first time what the foot is doing when it's beneath the sediment surface. And you can see how those bones match up to all the X-ray images and also to the, to the uh, video images too. And now we can add to this 3D scene. We can take a photogrammetric digital model of the tracks that are left in the poppy seeds and we can calibrate that into the 3D space. And so now we can look at the shape of the footprint and how that relates to the mo motion of the foot. Obviously the footprint surface is kind of static here and that's an issue that we'll get to in a moment. Uh, but very briefly, I want to drop down below that surface and you can see just how much motion we've been missing. That middle digit, digit three, is sinking to a depth of about five or six centimeters. Now the foot is only five or six centimeters long itself, so we're missing as much depth as the foot is long. So there's a lot of information there that we can get out from this uh, live bird. Now what do we do with it? Well, we take that motion and we simulate footprint formation. Because we know what the bones are doing, but we don't currently know what the sediment is doing. 
And so using something called the discrete element method, where we're using supercomputers to essentially model every single poppy seed, every single grain of sand, we validate it. Then we transfer the motion from the X-ray data into the simulation of the poppy seeds. And you can see that this is behaving sort of normally, and the surface that we're left with in the simulation matches the real surface very closely. But now we can start doing cool things. Now we can start making, for instance, the top one centimeter invisible. So on the left of this image, you can see uh, that's just the surface of the poppy seeds. But on the right, I've made the top one centimeter invisible. And what should be immediately apparent is that even though this is dry, behaving like dry sand, at the surface, you get no definition. You get no real footprint. But just a centimeter below the surface, you can start getting an idea of what the foot looked like. And so this led us to come up with this concept of track ontogeny, the development of a track. We can visualize the track being formed at any depth, at any point in the step cycle. And to give you an example of how that's helping us, this is the track that I showed you at the beginning with the uh, lasers sort of highlighting the curvature of the digits and things. And we had that pathology in the middle of the third digit. And we can see from our simulations, this isn't a pathology. This isn't some weird abnormality of the foot. What it is, is the foot exiting through that point and disturbing the entrance. So the footprint we're seeing is not a mold of the foot. It isn't directly correlated to the shape of the toes that went through. What we're seeing is both an entrance and an exit superimposed on top of each other. And so we can use the simulations, we can use the x-ray data to interpret fossil tracks in this way. And so far, it's proved pretty useful. That's me. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so my name is Imran Rahman. I'm a research fellow at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. And uh, Peter's given a really interesting um, talk about um, how organisms move. Um, uh, or how we can study that using modern methods. I'm going to talk a bit more about how organisms or how extinct organisms uh, feed or how we think they might have fed. So similar to the sorts of work Peter was discussing, one the method I've been using to study this is a, a computational method. So we're using computers to simulate um, extinct or past organisms. And the particular method is called computational fluid dynamics. And this is a method that's used much more widely in engineering, for example, to look at flows of fluids, so whether that be um, liquids or gases, water or air, around different objects. And you can see some examples here, and where we have different examples of a space shuttle, some boat, um, sorry, a, a plane and a car here. So it's used in engineering to try and understand how flows move around um, objects in order to improve the design of those objects. So that's a very useful technique for engineers, but it also has many possible applications beyond that. So in biology, in paleontology, in geology, for answering some sorts of questions that we've struggled to tackle for many years, um, such as how did extinct organisms, uh, many of which have no obvious um, modern relatives, how did they feed and how did they move? So today I just wanted to showcase a couple of examples from my own work and discuss the potential applications for this sort of approach um, more broadly and how this can help us understand um, quest or address questions which we've been unable to tackle in other ways. So the first example I wanted to present is based on a, um, a Precambrian fossil. So we're talking about something that is around 555 million years old from this so-called Ediacara biota, which is a very mysterious um, collection of uh, organisms. And there's a lot of debate about what these organisms are, whether they are, in fact, um, animals or whether they're precursors of animals or distantly related to modern animals. So there's a bit of debate about what they are. There's also debate about how they lived, how they moved, if they moved, and how they fed. So these are kind of outstanding questions which are important for understanding some of the earliest large organisms on Earth. So this example here, this is a fossil here. Hopefully you can make out the fossil in the rock. So this is an animal called, or sorry, an organism called uh, Tribrachidium. It's got a type of threefold symmetry. And we can digitally reconstruct that fossil. And this is an example of a three-dimensional computer reconstruction of that fossil on the right. And that's useful for understanding the fossil, but we want to take things a step further. So we want to try and explore how this organism might have fed. So it has been suggested that these things fed through passive absorption of nutrients, for example, through the body. 
And so we can run some simulations to explore this. So this is, this is a result of a computational simulation of, of uh, water flow around this um, object, around this organism. And the different colors correspond to the velocity of the current as it passes around the organism. And the arrows show you the direction of the current in different parts. So if this organism was, as had previously been hypothesized, um, passively absorbing nutrients, then we would expect to, expect to see a fairly even distribution of flow all over it in order to maximize its capabilities for absorbing food. But that's not what we see. The simulation actually shows us quite a different pattern where we have concentration of flow into distinct regions. So here we have um, a kind of upper view of the organism and here a side view. And you can see that we're getting concentration of flow into these distinct um, pits, if you will, in the organism. And this is much more compatible with, for example, suspension feeding, where you have um, a uh, concentration of flow to specific um, dedicated feeding structures. And this suggests that actually the feeding modes displayed by some of the earliest large organisms on Earth are actually more complex than have been previously appreciated. And, and some of these early ecosystems might have been um, capable of a range of different types of feeding, which is not necessarily something people thought before. Another example from my own work is work on echinoderms. So echinoderms, modern examples would be starfish and sea urchins, but in the fossil record, we have a whole range of weird and wonderful extinct groups. And this is an example from the Cambrian period. So we're talking 510 million years old or so, something of that sort. It's probably one of the earliest fossil echinoderms. So that means it's gonna be important for understanding the evolutionary history of the group, the earliest steps in the uh, evolution of modern forms. Here we have a fossil, um, and this is a computer model or computer reconstruction of that fossil based on a, um, a CT scan using x-rays. So this has allowed us to um, study the fossil in more detail. And again, this provides a basis for um, addressing other questions, in particular about feeding. So here are a couple of simulations um, of different types of feeding for this fossil. So these are both side-on views um, of the simulation. Again, similar to the previous images, we have the colors corresponding to different velocities or different current speeds. So on the top, we have what we call passive suspension feeding, which means that the animal was waiting for um, currents to drive food towards its mouth, and the M indicates position of the mouth. Um, and in this feeding mode, and if you look at the, the orientation and position of the arrows, we don't see any current flowing into the mouth. And this suggests this would be a, an inefficient way of feeding because there is no obvious way of gathering nutrients for the organism if it was feeding in this way. In contrast, um, an alternative is that it was an active suspension feeder, which means it's generating current to bring um, particles to its mouth. And if we simulate this, we can see a much more obvious or clear pattern where we're getting flow into the mouth. And this is kind of suggestive that this is more likely to be the feeding mode employed by this organism. And because this is a very early kind of very primitive form, this tells us something about the earliest evolution and the ancestor of all all the modern forms of echinoderms and helps us to reconstruct their evolutionary history. Um, and just to, to sort of end on, um, the approach I've discussed or presented, those are just two examples of some work I've been involved in. But there are many more potential applications uh, in paleontology for studying ancient organisms. I've talked predominantly about feeding and how we can use these sorts of methods to address questions related to feeding. But there's also many applications looking at movement, for example, and you can see a couple of examples of um, marine um, vertebrates here and how we can model flow around them in order to better understand um, what sort of <laughs> locomotion was they were undertaking. We can also explore the interaction between organisms and these some different a different simulation here where we've looked at flow around a range of different things and we can compare between different taxa. So this sort of approach which has sort of started only recently to be widely used in paleontology has many possible applications in the future for addressing questions which have been rather challenging to tackle in other ways. Um, so lastly, hello, my name is Thomas. I'm a um, third year PhD student um, at the University of Leicester. Um, I'm part of the paleobiology research group there. And uh, I also do experimental paleontology, but something quite different. Um, what I'm really interested in is the actual processes of fossilization. So um, I study uh, 300 million year old fossils from a place in America called, um, Illinois, um, called uh, Maison Creek in Illinois. And uh, these fossils are exceptional because um, there are lots of organisms there that you would recognize today, things like fish um, and uh, jellyfish. Uh, worms, insects, but 
but they preserve soft tissues. So they preserve things like livers, guts, gills, um, muscles, uh, even eyeballs. Uh, we even see the preserved remains of pigments. And uh, my work focuses on trying to understand the actual processes that occur to an animal post-death um, and what processes control the fossilization potential. So we do that by uh, doing experiments on extant animals. So for instance, uh, we use uh, fish carcasses. So we buy fish from fishmongers and uh, we set them up in experiments where we can uh, not only observe the, the physical properties of decay, so when certain organs and tissues uh, decay, but we can look at the internal conditions. And that's what we're pioneering for the very first time. So there has been work previously looking at uh, if you were to rot a fish, which bits rot first, and which disappear. And that's very important because um, if you look at a fossil, if uh, let's say, for instance, uh, the muscles are, look different to modern animals, then paleontologists might interpret that it had a different uh, muscle physiology to modern fish. But actually, because decay takes place on these animals, we have to be quite careful. But we are really interested in the actual chemical um, conditions required to preserve soft tissues. So uh, soft tissues, in order to become preserved in the fossil record, are replaced by minerals. And minerals need certain minerals like calcium phosphate require very specific conditions to preserve. And they require the condition around the animal carcass to become quite acidic. And we can, for the first time, um, using our experiments, we can show what happens internally to a carcass in real time. So we make tiny incisions in the body of the fish and insert uh, special equipment inside the fish and then reseal those wounds, a lot like a surgeon would do uh, during an operation. And we then can plot in real time the changing chemical conditions during decay. And uh, our, our data is sent to us uh, every half an hour. It's sent to my phone. So while I'm talking to you now, my data is being collected. And then we can then plot those changes in chemistry and we can work out whether uh, this animal would have been able to fossilize uh, should it have been uh, entombed in, in, in some sort of sediment. And so our work is, is really pioneering that and we're showing for the first time, um, it's been previously thought that the entire carcass was needed to generate the conditions around it in order to become a fossil. But what we're showing for the first time is that individual organs inside the animal can actually generate their own microenvironments. And that's work that we're presenting here. So I'll be happy to take any questions that you have on that. Thank you very much for your insightful, insightful presentations. We can now open the floor for questions. Um, Peter, you, um, uh, sorry, Jonathan Amos, BBC News. Peter, you ended uh, your presentation with a little teaser. I wonder if you could <laughs> carry on, which is to say what, you know, what you've been using this, this for and what you got out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that was a bit mean, just <laughs> putting that one slide up. Um, I'm trying to think of a way to make this general. It's been most useful in little details. So there's a particular collection of cr tracks, uh, the, B the Bineski Museum of Natural History in Amherst. And these tracks are uh, a historical collection. They were collected over 200 years ago by Edward Hitchcock. And they're very special. Uh, the, the track that I showed you was from that collection. They're, they don't look like feet. They look messy. Uh, and it turns out these are the best kinds of tracks because they contain the most information. They're, the foot is moving more. It's not just stamping down. And so there's a, there's a lot of details there. So things like the exit traces, we now have a better grasp of what an exit trace looks like, what it means for the fossil. And so we're able, uh, and I'll be talking about this later this afternoon, to actually reconstruct dinosaur foot motions from fossil tracks, you know, really detailed things. And of course, the problem there is these are messy tracks, they're walking in sloppy, deep mud, so the motion you're reconstructing isn't a typical motion. It's, in some cases, almost swimming. Uh, these smallish dinosaurs blobbing through very, very wet mud. Um, so basically, yeah, it's, it's all these tracks that previously have been very, very hard to interpret. We're now able to use the simulations and say, okay, this feature occurs when this foot does this in this kind of sediment, and tie it back to the foot motions themselves. I mean, just as we walk differently in snow and, and sand, 
um, these guys presumably are, are walking differently in, mm. in, in these environments. Yeah? yeah, absolutely. And and we've got um, XROM data of guinea fowl walking on poppy seeds, on firm mud, on very sloppy mud. And yeah, they're doing different things all the time. So we've got a whole range of foot motions there that we can tie to dinosaurs. The big, the big reason we want to do this is dinosaurs... Uh, theropod dinosaurs at least are very similar to birds in many ways they have two legs they have three toes um, but dinosaurs have this big muscular tail and so the legs are driven from the tail whereas birds don't have a big muscular tail and that's why we have chicken drumsticks because all the muscle moves down onto the legs and I'm interested in can we see the differences that means for locomotion by looking at the footprints and that's a longer term question I'll answer that one in about 10 years <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any additional questions, either from here in the room or from the live stream? Uh, no? Okay. Uh, if not, we'll finish here. You are welcome to approach our panelists and book one of the interview rooms we have available. And I'll see you here at 12.30 for the next press conference on methane seepage in the Arctic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.